We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios once again, Dorley Rainey. Dorley Rainey is a longtime Seattle activist. She's a former school board member in Issaquah, a former PTA president, former mayoral candidate, former candidate for King County Council, and currently a member of Women in Black. Dorley, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Mike, for having me. It's always a pleasure. So start out, you have uh, you are involved with many different issues, but uh, the one I see you most active with of late is foreclosures and our uh, banking system. In fact, you were just recently uh, arrested at a Wells Fargo bank. Can you talk about that whole issue? Yes. Well, I work with uh, SAFE. That stands for Standing Against Foreclosure and evictions. It is an organization that was uh, coming out of the uh, 99 protests and a lot of very committed people working there to help people who are going through foreclosures. This uh, whole mess was precipitated by fraudulent actions by Washington Mutual and other banks. Countrywide was one of the banks that took uh, marginal or low marginal loans. And uh, finally, when uh, Washington Mutual went bankrupt, uh, they they had uh, Countrywide was one of the banks that they worked with. So Countrywide's loans were all in trouble. And uh, when the uh, bailouts came, there were five big banks, uh, uh, General Motors and others, who got a lot of money. But the banks were supposed to help people to either stay in their homes, to pay rent, to lower their payments, or help in any way, shape, or form to uh, stop the hurt. Uh, What the banks are doing now is they they say, all right, you have to bring X amount of papers in that we need to track your loan because the loans, if if it were a Washington Mutual loan and a countrywide loan, it may have gone for servicing to Chase or to Wells Fargo or to uh, U.S. Bank. And... uh, then they sold them off to other people and they split the good ones off from the bad ones and kept uh, Deutsche Bank, for instance, became involved. They got loans. So one one foreclosure we had, we, uh, we uh, found out that Wells Fargo was the servicer for Deutsche Bank, who said, we never owned the loan, we just got the paper. Their mortgages are very hard to trace because they got split up in different parcels to get sold off to investors. And so we uh, we did have a very specific problem with Wells Fargo. Uh, they absolutely refused to talk to anybody. And the person that we worked with, we went into the bank with a check, and they would not even let us go near the bank, anywhere to anywhere towards the tellers or to the uh, managers. Um, we have made at least six attempts to pay that mortgage, and uh, Wells Fargo will not accept it. We found out then that they were just servicing that loan for Deutsche Bank, who was also servicing it for uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, for uh, Chase. So um, the biggest problem is, and I'm finally seeing that the Justice Department is stepping in. Uh, The uh, sheriff now will not evict people. uh, Only, I'm sorry. The sheriff will not arrest us when we do a sit-in in front of a house that's going to be evicted. Um, a discussion I had with the sheriff. He said, we will have to do the eviction 
but we're going to change the way we do them, not the way they used to go break in practically in the middle of the night and drag people out. And so now at least they, they will not arrest people in front of a house. But we did a sit-in at Wells Fargo up there by the, by the library. And we just walked in and sat down by the wall and started reading the demand letters. And the demand said that uh, uh, we will leave as soon as you live up to the bargain you made when you got bailed out. And now we sang a little song. Finally, the management, they kept doing business. There were people actually going into the bank. <coughs> I like that button. <coughs> so now what I do? Turn it on. You're fine. So anyway, uh, when we didn't even get handcuffed. And then, for some reason, the bank did not s file a suit against us. But the city attorney thought it was necessary that he would file a lawsuit against us. And uh, we went to pretrial. And then, all of a sudden, the uh, city attorney canceled the lawsuit, dismissed it. So I guess we're free and clear again to do that all over again. So city attorney Pete Holmes? Pete Holmes. Felt that... He filed the lawsuit against us for sitting at Wells Fargo. Wow. But then, of course, you have to realize that Wells Fargo is the city's bank. So I understand that the uh, city of Seattle just recently uh, changed laws to... Uh, review in the future any financial institutions they have dealings with so but that clears wells fargo for now yes it does well the other the other hurdle is that they have to have one of the big banks because we don't have a state bank and other private banks or uh, uh, small state banks don't have the uh, money to service the short and long-term business that the city has. Some of the money has to be there immediately when they have to pay bills, and some banks and credit unions don't have the kind of reserves. So once you get into this, there's just no end to the problems that have to be solved before we can really see some progress. And they are the reluctance of our elected officials to actually do something is staggering. So you were prepared to be arrested and or serve time for this issue? Whatever, yes. Because I am I'm very lucky. I, I live on Social Security. I don't have any great needs. And... The young people can't do it. They cannot take time off from work. We had uh, two teachers with us, and they were really frightened that they might lose a job over, over something like this, or get incarcerated, or have to get a, a big fine that they need to pay off. So not everybody can do sit-ins, because, you, you know, you you lose time and money when you when you sit in somewhere and have to go to jail. And how many of these uh, of the safe events have you participated in in the last year or so? Well, a lot of them. I don't know. I've, I've been arrested twice. Once at the house up of Jeremy. I don't know if you know the story of Jeremy. He's the guy that kept wanting to pay the bank, and the bank would not take his money. Interesting. So that is that the same case that you were uh, in at the bank and got arrested for, or was that a different that situation? Was, that was at his house. Okay. 
All right. So another issue that you have, uh, we've, we've all been focusing on longer and appears to be having some troubles at the moment is the, uh, the tunnel, the, the deep bore tunnel. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? The deep boring tunnel. Well, when when those of us who fought against the tunnel tried to get things done properly, I have files that some engineers and really knowledgeable people put together against the tunnel, and we could not get a hearing. Um, there was all this problem with... Uh, getting our material in front of the city council, and you cannot do that in two minutes. Uh, there's no such a thing as a meaningful dialogue with the city council, as it is now constituted until the end of the year, when we may have more direct involvement with the public from our city council, I have some hopes that we'll have more than just Shama. Um, and, but when I look at what's going on now, the uh, cost overruns are already there. Every day that tunnel machine sits there another day is another day of cost overruns. And uh, the people don't really realize the problems that's going to face us with transportation, with the traffic, the transit cuts, and the uh, all the other transportation cuts, that uh, people will not go through the tunnel. Because if you want to go from West Seattle to downtown Seattle, you cannot go to the tunnel. You have to go down the surface roads to get into downtown. Or you can go all the way from West Seattle to the Seattle Center and then turn around and go back downtown. The congestion is going to be horrific. And that the city fathers and mothers didn't see that is beyond me. It was um, pure chicanery. It was that's what we want and we're going to get it no matter what. They would not look at papers we brought in uh, we knew that this was all filled down there. Uh, that was not considered. I remember walking up with one of our flyers to a highly elected public official as they were going to a meeting to talk about the tunnel with the governor, then governor. And I reached out to hand him my flyer and it just went like this. And that's what we got. Yeah, no dialogue. So now we got the mess, and we have the uh, overruns, and nobody will talk about who is actually going to be on the hook for those overruns. So maybe I do a sequel when I get the answer, then I'll tell you who is going to pay for the cost overruns. Right now it's Seattle. And as a citizen, I really object to that. So, that's. It's interesting that Ed Murray, who was at the state level and at one point indicated that Seattle would be picking up the tab, the ex the over the uh, overrun tab, is now mayor of Seattle, and wonder if he'll be singing the same tune. That's that's right. Yeah, he was on the transportation committee. Yeah, I know. Uh, and we see this with everything else. You know, with the uh, Sounder and Metro having their problems. The Sounder spent extraordinary money on the shelters and all these frills that we have now on the bus lines, on the D lines, on the rapid ride. The, uh, you cannot really predict when a certain bus is going to be somewhere, especially when they go from West Seattle through the Sodo mess and, uh, and all the way out to, to uh, Ballard. By cutting, 
there used to be two bus lines that went across the ballot bridge. Now there's only one. And it's so over full in those buses that sometimes you wait for two or three buses to even get on a bus. And sometimes passengers are standing in front of the yellow line because there's no room. And I asked the bus driver, I said, what's the capacity of this bus? She said, I don't know. Uh, but the, they put in two extra people with the fare police that go around and check your, your ORCA card to make sure that you paid your fare. And there are two of them that go around and close up the buses, and everybody has to put their ORCA card out, and they check it. So in a bus that's already super full, these two people just add to the aggravation on the bus. It's not that people don't like, you know, they're not mad at the, at the bus cops, but it is just one of these intrusions. And all the bus riding I do, and for me it's a bargain because I ride the buses more than anybody all over the world. But it's an intrusion for very little results. I have only one time seen them take one person off the bus for a fair infraction. That's make work, and it's, it's really a redundancy because sooner or later, this guy is gonna get off the bus <clears throat> they have not been out a lot of money. And they pay a payroll now. I don't know how many people they've hired, but they write the D buses and the, the A, and A, B, and C and D buses. So that's a lot of payroll. And they're looking at a 17% cut, a proposed 17% cut. Yeah. When it seems they should be going the opposite way. Exactly. Yeah. So, but the the buses, you know, at, if you want to go from Ballard to Seattle at around 2.33, between 2.30 and 3.30, when all the school kids from Ballard High get out, you can wait for three or four buses to get on. And nobody ever comes and checks this out. That the fare patrol should check to see if that bus is over capacity and make a report. But we have people that are slotted in to do one thing, check the fare, and don't see anything around you. Don't see that that bus is overstretched, that there are too many people on this bus. And if an accident happens, it's gonna be mayhem. So I, th I think the, uh, the people that run the uh, parking patrol and those fair patrol people, they all ought, ought to check and see what else is going on around where they stop. They should not just give a ticket to the guys over park, but if they see some vandalism going on, they ought to report it. Or a huge pothole somewhere, they should, they should report it. But no, this is red. This is not their job, and everybody does only their job, which is not very cost effective. You've lived in Seattle since nineteen fifty six. Yes. Has the have you always used uh, the bus system? Has it gotten worse since then? No. Um, we had one car, and my ex worked for Boeing down on Harbor Island, and if I wanted to go somewhere, in those days, we, we had buses, but it wasn't as good as even now. And I had to go drive them down and, and pick them up from work again, but I used to say to my daughter, do you look out for where the space needle is? And they headed for the space needle to make it home okay because 
I couldn't find my way home from Harbor Island without the Space Needle there. Now you can barely see it. But uh, no, I, I plead guilty. I had a car. And finally the kids started working and they shared a car. So yeah, I'm, I'm really doing uh, my mea culpas here. I've done the same things. I've had cars. I drove to places where I could have walked. But we all were in this great mode of tomorrow never comes. And it's here now. Tomorrow is here now. With the pollution and with uh, the climate change and everything else. Yeah. So we only have about eight minutes left. You ran for mayor of Seattle, uh, and we have a new mayor coming in here uh, in another month. Uh, what would you recommend as changes to our new mayor coming in if uh, you had the power? Well, I, I really don't know enough about Murray. That's the funny thing. You know, he was on all kinds of committees, but he never really came, you say, oh yeah, Murray. All right, I grant him, he stuck with this project of gay marriage and he finally pushed that through. That, but that's really the only thing that sticks in my mind. And you know, I've been to, I go to Olympia a lot. I've never had the feeling of a great leader there. And so I, I don't know what I would ask Murray to do because you know we've already asked for more funding for schools and we asked for more funding for home, homeless people and stuff like that. And now he seems to embrace things like the $15 an hour um, minimum wage which is a good thing, but uh, it was not his original thought. It, uh, it is a coattail kind of thing, I think. So he's going to have to do a few things before I can really peg him into what can he accomplish and what will he do. I mean, he cannot undo the devil. Uh, he... Uh, he would have to really get busy working with the homeless problem. Uh, and Seattle City Council is a very vindictive organization. When you think what they did to Nickersville, where they were split into three camps, split families, uh, now they have to have extra Porta potties. They have to have extra dumpsters. They have to pay deposit on dumpsters and things. So everything they do is now three times as expensive. And the city gave five hundred thousand dollars to the Union Gospel Mission to put ten people into housing. And the first thing you know, and I'm not saying it's all bad. It's not all bad. But it's a misdirection of funds. And just because the name Nicholsville does not go down well with some of the city council people and some other leaders in town, doesn't mean that the homeless people don't deserve a chance. You, you see this vindictiveness when you go to the bus shelters, where there used to be benches, we don't know, we can't have that. The homeless people will sit there, or maybe even a drunk, for God's sake. We can't have that. So now they got one little seat in the bus shelters. So if there are two old ladies, one loses. No, yeah, period. You stand up, you sit down. It's, it is visible all over Seattle, the nastiness. When you look at the ledges, uh, the windows at the courthouse, they got these metal things, cl clips. 
by the windows, window sills, just so nobody sit there. And you find these things all over town, um, where there's a, a place where somebody might be able to sit down. They put the clips up there. And I'm not sure what else they're going to do next. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping for a humane, a more humane city council than what we have now. But as to the mayor, I'm going to have to just wait and see. All right. In, in three minutes, can you sum up why people should become active about things they care about? Well, one of the things, it feels good when you do something besides sit and watch YouTube cartoons. It just, you, you feel like you're there for something. And I have friends who really are depressed because they feel useless. And I said, you want to go with me? Well, I have to play cards tonight, okay? But they ask me the next time, but the next time they have to do something else, like watch some television show or a soap opera or something. Uh, it is invigorating to be out there. I love riding the buses. I find somebody I know on the buses almost every day. And if not, somebody else will say something and we'll start a conversation and it's fun. And people miss an awful lot by not being active. And it's interesting business. You know, like for instance, Right in the middle of this Boeing mess, the Brazil, Brazil has now just canceled a uh, fighter, 36 fighter checks, jets that Boeing was supposed to build for Brazil and gave it to the great Swedish car maker Saab. I didn't know they made airplanes or stuff like that. I never knew that. Uh, and Boeing has always wanted to be done in California. And I would say to them, go to Long Beach and don't monkey with the others because what you get in California is a heck of a lot more congressional people than any other state. So if I were a Boeing guy, I'd go split the, the 717 or the new one now half seas with, with down at Long Beach. I remember when we worked day and night, I, I was a Boeing wife, on the Visto. And California won it. And that's about the time there was the billboard up. Said, we, well, uh, the last person out turn off the lights. Because California had the congressional clout that Seattle, we only had nine people then. Now we got ten now. So, but um, this is this is where they know to put their resources. So figure out where the most bang is for their buck. So that's my advice for Boeing today. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us again this morning. Thank you.